Great. Thanks, uh, Pierre. You can see the philosophy of the school. They're terrified by the president. They have to say good things about them, you know. <laughs> but no, it's a real pleasure to have you here in such a large number, because this is really something that really passions me. I do believe, I don't know if it's going to be me, MOOC, whatever, but we're at the time where I really think that all this online education is happening and will change universities, even, I would say, the top research universities. So let me give you a little bit my view of the thing. Now, I have five slides just as an introduction. You all know it because you're interested by this. But we know that nothing fundamentally new with MOOCs. We knew that from the 60s on, you know, we had various uh, initiatives. <clears throat> Switzerland, for example, had the, a program called the Campus Virtuel, Virtual Campus, where I think they've spent about more than 30 million. And really, you know, those were the pioneers, but the numbers were small. And something we know, something happened, and this became massive. And I'll come back to it. And I think the ma we're paying the price of massive today. We also know that, you know, there are several things that, it's, but this one that got, you know, the most uh, reviews and, and, and that got the press, the lay press excited was the experience uh, of uh, Thrun and Nordvik for this introduction to artificial intelligence. As we know, we had, there was about 160,000 registered, 22,000 completed the course, 400 perfect scores, and I think it's probably the legend says, not from Stanford. But I think this was sufficient that, that Tom Friedman and so on wrote articles and so on, and it got instantaneously a lot of visibility. And I think the key thing, the two words, and I'll come back because that's where the criticism are coming today, is massive and open. Massive, why massive? A lot of reasons, but I think we should probably thank Steve Jobs and so on, the tablets, the mobility, the broadband, the cloud computing, social networks, and this digital generation that really made something happening very quickly, very fast. We also know that some of the key features, uh, like the open access, the fact that it's freely accessible, or at least until now, that the big schools got into it, that it is potentially personalizable with section is short modules, video, quiz, assignments, adapting learning speed. And I think the genius really of uh, Coursera and EDX and Uda City was a synchronization that allowed crowdsourcing of learning tasks, peer grading, and discussion forums with bulletin board. That's really what probably had attracted the students on those platforms. Now, we also know that anything that starts tend to be US dominated, and that's a bit of the problem for us as European, and this is always the first mover's advantage. Those, and you know them, those are the various platforms, uh, and I think two of them became very prominent, EDX and Coursera. UDCD2, but I think because of the nature of the business, is less impacting what we do on a daily basis. Now, we also know that, you know, finally Europe responded. It also says, when you look at it, Fun, Future Learn, Eva City, Miriada, you can say those are languages or countries behind, which is a first potential problem. You know, France with France University in England with Future Learn, University with Germany, Merida, the, the Spanish-speaking world. And Open Ed will hear later on about it, so I will not say anything about it. And also, we will, we will have to acknowledge this is not only US Europe, but that the rest of the world, China, the Arab world, and also at a more modest level, uh, Africa became interested. And we've been a key element in trying to promote this in the sub-Saharan Africa especially through this network called RECIF. Now, we also have to acknowledge that there are a couple of front runners, and the front runners, at least in the academic world, being Coursera and EDX, I'm happy that key people from those two initiatives are present today. That's the latest that I could see last night. 603 courses announced in, on Coursera, 140 on EDX. Uh, we also know if one says it's non-profit, the other for profit, but you know, those are, the, the, the limits are a bit blurred. And, but I think what is key, one it has an appropriate platform, the other one an open source platform. So you can see that there are subtle differences, but our faculty have to realize how to go. Now the other key thing, you could see those small logos, which was very different from before. The top, the world-class research university got onto it. 
And this, uh, you have the who's who, at least in the US, the Ivy League school, the MIT, the Stanfords, uh, but also in Europe, uh, some of the top schools aren't. Very few aren't both. I think we're, we, us and Rice, now I think those are extending, are uh, on both platforms. We thought it would be important to try to test the pros and the cons of each of them. So that's for the general uh, uh, survey. Now, as Pierre was saying, I think it's important to go to the data, really the facts, and not just the anecdotes. So what is EPFL first analysis? First, we could say, when did we start? It's true, in, in May, I think, 2012, I had heard, so I took the plane and I went to visit uh, uh, the West Coast, and I visited Utah City, Coursera, spoke with John Achimendi, the provost at uh, Stanford, I had also a call with John Hennessy, the president, and the piece of people in charge of this. And I came back convinced that something was happening and we ought to do something. So in fact, we first signed with Coursera and we've released the first MOOC in the fall of 2012. So I think with Edinburgh, we were probably the first one that had in Europe put a MOOC online. And in February, we had the nice visits of the EDX management and Ant Agarwal and his colleagues came and we also signed an agreement with the EDX. We also created in the spring of 2013 our Center for Digital Education that is headed by Pierre and what he calls the MOOC factory. In the fall, we have 10 new MOOC running and we have registered, but I'll come back to this. I think one of the problem is when we talk about registration because you have an inflation of numbers, those are great, but then you go back and then you can see uh, you know, this dropout rate, which is quite significant. Now, in the spring of 2014, we have 10, 10 running courses in parallel, seven new. But I think the key one was really uh, this uh, gentleman, uh, Professor Mata Odeski. He's the father of a key uh, programming language called Scala. So he put this on September 18th. And yes, we had, just, we, we had no clue. We just tested the program and just put it on Coursera. And he had 50,000 students registered online. So, of course, everybody's happy to say, yeah, it might work. But the most interesting, he had 10,000 students that took the final exam. So, I guess, in, still in Corsa, it's one of the very high retention at 20%. So, so, for me, that was kind of an interesting first. So, but we wanted to know, so what are those students? In fact, it's probably due to the course itself. But I think it's a beautiful example of something that we have a hard time to do, which is continuous or professional education. So you can see in this course, the majority of the students had already a, a, a university degree. Those are with PhD, master's, or bachelor. So you can see the undergrads are certainly not very present. In fact, he ran the course in parallel to his students. And the grades of the students online were about the same as the one on campus. You can say, gee, 10,000 students that are as good as our 60 students. But explain, this is a second year course then they were competing to some extent with people that had already a university degree. So I think for me, this is the first very interesting thing is I'll come back to it. I think for continuous education, MOOC is probably an outstanding tool. But also something that was very interesting but shocked us, very quickly after the University of Helsinki was the first, Department of Computer Science says, Functional programming principal Scala, Martin Ozeski, MOOC available for our students. We'll stop it to teach and we'll just proctor the exam. But that's quite you know, shocking to some extent that somebody will just, we had the impression, hijack your course to do it. So I think it is, but it's when you think about it, it's normal. Those are the new textbooks. And I think if you want to learn Scala, probably it's better to, work, to learn it from the guy that really invented the language. So getting directly from Mata Odeski is probably better to get it from a student or a student from a student. And I think this is probably key. So I think that's what I call the USP, the unique selling proposition. Each of us probably have a couple of those star professors that have something totally unique that would be you know, very interesting to a large crowd. This is usually for advanced courses. So now, just so you don't have to read the detail, but there are two things important there. This is the current situation. So we have produced 21 courses. 13 are in the pipeline being produced. We run 17 online. Four are tested. Some of our faculty said, let me first test it in-house. In so they are on the internet, but not open to the other students. You can see the colors there. 
you know, we're an interesting institution in this regard that we're probably one of the rare bilingual French-English technical school in the world. And we have a capability, in fact, to uh, do a curricula as much as in English or in French. And this is probably rather unique. It's also a very interesting feature, and I'll come back to it, when you're talking about Africa. So that's exactly the situation where we are. And yes, those numbers are wonderful. Pierre comes back and says, have you seen the great numbers go up? And you can see these are the first 10 professors that got the registration. And I'm insisting registration. And now the second thing you can see, the one on blue are in English, and the one in French are in green. So this is the first difference. It's about a 1 to 10 ratio. If you put a course in French or in English, you'll have 10 times many students if you put it in English than in French. So in terms of market, this is the first. And I'll come back to the geolocalization of those students. The second thing that we know is a dropout. So you can see that come once, 73. Watch video, 61. Do video quiz, 41. Turn in assignment, 25. Two quizzes exercise 23, and now completed successfully only 8%. But when you look, it's still 32,000 participants that completed a course. So if you would forget about the 400,000, but you would keep this, everybody would be quite satisfied. So I think we have to be very careful about this registration, which leads to inflation of numbers. And I think, but the second thing is also, those are tough courses, a lot of them. So it's quite natural that people would not be able to necessarily complete them. It's also a lot of the people like us that try that. And to be honest, I tried three courses, but I didn't complete a single one. And I don't have the time. Probably this is far and so on. But I thought this was an interesting experiment. So I think even though this looks important, those could get something out of it. And I think we should keep this in mind. So I think we should. I think if there's something that this conference should try to do is to know what are the kind of statistics that we report. And only, you know, reporting registering students is a problem. Now, if you look at it, it's interesting in terms of the breakdown, geo breakdown. Those are the courses taught in English. Now you can see functional programming, di uh, digital signal processing, linear discrete optimization, and so on. Those are high level technical courses, typically third or fourth year. Uh, uh, EPFL student. Now we have more introductory courses. Those are taught in French. And what you could see now, you see that Europe, unfortunately the color is not exactly in blue, it's Europe, green Africa, Asia, Americas. Now you can see in advanced courses, it's more or less equal between Europe, Asia, and Americas. If you go to introductory courses taught in French, you can see, of course, that Europe is a big part, but you can see that Africa, and the more you work on it, and I think this is probably, for me, the most exciting thing. Africa is trying to catch up through those courses. And I think there's a very unique possibility. Now, you look in terms of languages, and you can see if you get your, our courses in, 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 in Europe, of course, are more attended by the French than the, the English-speaking one, or the, the English courses. Now, this is inverted in America. I'm surprised that that many people will, are willing to take a course taught in French in the Americas. This is a very uh, interesting uh, 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 surprise. The other thing is Africa. It's very clear. We, but I think we worked out. Now, you can see that Western Africa, I do remember when I was in Davos a couple of years ago, we were speaking about an outreach program for Africa. This is a meeting dominated at the university president by the English speaking by the Americans. And we came with it, and there were 30 universities, all were English-based. So I had to say, you know, what about the French part? And one of my very distinguished colleagues said, yeah, we forgot that part of Africa speaks French. And I think this is a, a very good illustration that the language will matter. Asia also surprising that some are able to take the course in English, in French, sorry. So MOOCs at EPFL, what have we learned? Maybe the most and important thing for our people would be this, that production is nothing to put it together, but our faculty, and they ought to be really thanked, it's a lot of work. This is probably between the design, record, review, edit, check, publish. So we had to put a whole organization. 
All our professors are fantastic, but some are probably even better than others said in front of a camera. So I think you want to be sure. Of course, if you teach a mediocre course in front of 20 people or you put it online, it has very different impact in terms of your brand. As a university president, this is something that you have to watch carefully. We know that the format, we have more or less three kind of formats, all online, static quo. What I call static quo is, is our, what our students are doing these days. They have a lecture, exercise, they go to homework, they come back. And now we've added what they call a video, a MOOC. They love it, but for now, I don't think that we have found the blended learning. The flip core classroom is still an issue. And when you ask our students, and this is the first survey of our and campus students, they say MOOCs are good support material, however, it, has, it is not seen as a valuable alternative to ex cathedra courses. That's what our students think today. So you can see that, do you think MOOC are good add to normal in-class? Yes, 80%. Do you think that MOOC can, can completely substitute a normal in-class lecture? The same majority says no. So I think this is something that we will have to struggle. Now, is that just a beginning or not? But there are concerns. If you look at the on-campus organization, overall 61% find positive, good qu quality, useful for learning, complete, complement to lecture, we like to replay, flexible schedule, all the kind of thing we know. But also they're very concerned about lo loss of social interaction. This is something uh, that, but now it's interesting, when one of our professor goes online in, 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 and goes physical presence, at least, at least in computer science, a lot of students do not show up. So even though they think this, practically, they tend not to come to the lecture. Quality, match between video and exercise. You said the video is easy, but the exercises are difficult. So you could see what are the, those overall issues. Now, let me just move on one thing that I think is very important. I spent the last six months, I was authorized by our government to take a leave of absence of six months. I had asked because I think something is happening with this online education specifically for developing countries. And I think for Europe, the closeness, both culturally and geographically with Africa is a key one. So I traveled a lot in West, Central, East, South. I was supposed to go to South Sudan about one week before it, the outbreak, so this I didn't see that far. But the rest, you can see just, I was just giving a lecture on, on MOOCs and so on in Yaoundé, in the Ecole Polytechnique Supérieure of Yaoundé. You could see the students are really thirsty. I was really, uh, uh, you know, uh, incredibly uh, 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 intrigued to see their enthusiasm for those kind of things. So we had done at the time, and I will not go into detail, uh, uh, a network of uh, the top French-speaking schools in the world in the technical and science arena. Those are some of the representative of those schools, some in Africa, some in Asia, even Haiti, uh, and some of the North. And this is from uh, Quebec, Belgium, France, Switzerland that we tried to work together to put a network of labs and so on, but that's when, in fact, MOOCs just came. And this was in a perfect timing. So we had and developed with them a kind of a strategy. What comes from our African colleagues is they have great need for mathematics, physics, computer science. They have a huge massification problem of education. As you know, their infrastructure is quite limited and with this massification of all this youth coming to the age of higher education, they do not see how they can handle And they see this as a unique opportunity. So I think, but now you have to implement, and implementation is not that easy. You have to get the instructors on, you know, on board. Collaboration with the teacher's level. Integration of the MOOCs in the local curricula. Also, this is all for the, and also have a need for I would say specialized course for Africa. Water, energy, nutrition, health. So there's a need for specialization and continuing education. So for example, we just now add a new course called La Ville Africaine, the African city, about working about urbanization, water treatment. Those are the kind of things that need to be tailored for those places. Interestingly, just you could see uh, you know, that the teaching language come back is key. You could see in Morocco, in Algeria, Tunisia, Cameroon, Côte d'Ivoire, you get, you could see that for this western part of Africa and northern Africa, French is a key uh, a language. So I think we have to take this into consideration. 
dissemination, a lot of issues, and specifically uh, uh, the bandwidth, which is not present often, uh, even on campuses, even on big campuses. So I think we, ha we can start to, to work out offline solution for the short term, but we know that this will come. It's only a question of time. But they're so thirsty that we have to do something about it. I said teaching language matters, involvement of local faculty, and I think you have to blend. And I'm very thankful that several of our professors that have put courses online for our students are now spending time in Africa to talk with instructors in those countries to try to get them to uh, uh, buy into the concept. Also, the credits is key if a university, and even more so if it is self-learners. We also need to be included in local curricula. I think we need to bundle the MOOCs to form curricula it depends on state-edited regulations. So I've met a lot of ministers of those countries to see how this could be done. I think there's also a need to create collaborative MOOCs with partners of many, of many partners, but this is also a challenge because these need to be coordinated. Usually it's already difficult on one campus, but if you put several campuses together, it's even more so. So I think we have to go to this blended learning, and I think you have to integrate it into the local curricula. You have to build local capacity, and you have to have a network of instructors. So you could say, can this go to massification? Probably not. But if you have 1,000, maybe 10,000 African students, It'd be just impossible to have 10,000 students here, African students, on, on, on our ground. And I think what is very interesting is when you start to play local coordination, you get some results. Those are two examples. Uh, one course called a microcontroller, uh, micro the other one, initiation to C++ uh, 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 computing. And you can see, for example, that Africa, even the uh, uh, sub saharan the Western and Central Africa, you have hundreds of students. But you have to realize that we have put instructors over there. And the more instructors, the more students that you get. Completion rate is not an issue. It's more than 95% if you, it's done that way. So I think it's a mixture, really. And again, going to this massive, I think this massive is polluting partially the debate. But I think whenever you go to the developing countries, you have to bring some level of help in structures uh, 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 for the uh, help for the instructors. So, what are the key things that uh, uh, we would like to say now? The first and most important thing about the general observations. And these, those are my own. I think, you know, MOOCs are tremendously interesting and have huge potential. I still believe in it, in them. The most important thing is probably for continuous education. That's for our part of the world. What I call the USP, Euling Selling Proposition. The course on Scala, uh, programming, I think, is a very good example. So this will have to be developed. This can be monetized, for example. And I think uh, this will see, we'll see with time. We'll have to find the right way. But I'm quite hopeful this will continue. I think MOOCs are a unique tool for developing countries. We've uh, put together this Africa initiative, but I think it's the same in Asia, in other parts of the world. I think on our campus, we have to handle this with care. I would say it's a complementary tool for online, uh, for on-campus education. We have to find the proper blend. We have also to be careful that our students do not reject because of the hype and understand that there's this one more tool, but, you know, start to see that for their continuous education and so on, this will and could become important. And also that we need to do something about developing countries. So, you know, the hype cycle. I say this is the US, I don't know exactly where we are, but sometime there. Uh, and I think, you know, we as we're very early on, that's probably the same thing here. Problem in Europe is a bit slower, so we're still, I would say, probably somewhere there, just going a little bit down. But I think it's like everything in medicine, it's the same. It's the one that stick that will contribute. So, but I think the, the, the basic is so important that I cannot foresee this not happening, a huge, happening, happening a, having a huge impact on our own institution. So what are the general issues? We've heard about them. Plagiarism is one of them. Copyright. So, you know, whenever we do research, we tend to sign things to the editors. We will have to be a bit more careful of what, of course, the impact copyright has, but also maybe 
us as university to retain more some of the copyright. And this, between the platforms and the university, will have to be settled. The high dropouts, so now the Americans, but are very fast, came with a new term, Spark for Small Private Online Courses. I think this is very interesting. This is a very US. And again, in Davos, I was discussing with some of the top, uh, the president of the top schools. For, for them, it is a key issue. Tuition is about a third of the budget in the top US universities. This is the chance and the opportunity for Europe. We do not have. I always remind people that, you know, it's less than a thousand euro to come and, 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 and uh, study at EPFL, even if you are Chinese. So this is quite, in, more than 50% of our students are foreign. So I think this is something absolutely unique. We do not have the same concern about putting our courses online in terms of financial impact on the university. I think we have to reinvent this flip classes. I'm sure that you will talk a lot about it. For now, I think our teachers told us this is the most difficult. What do you do once the student has gone through the, through the, the, the course? The difficulty of handling on campus and online students in parallel. Often, for example, a, a recent course, one of our faculty said, I have 60,000 uh, uh, on campus and 37,000 off campus. You know, those are two. So how do you relate between the physical present and the virtual? This is going to be something important. Heavy workload for teachers, no doubt about it. And I think certification. We all heard about the platforms offer solution being the signature track, ID verified certificates of achievement, new forms of award. I think this gamification of learning is an interesting one. How will the market react to that? Difficult to say. I think we'll need, and I think we've seen already some bundling courses towards a degree, X series sequence for EDX, for example. But we see the first MOOC based degree, uh, a master in computer science from Georgia Tech. We've heard that maybe there would be a, an MBA from Wharton. I think we have to invent new forms of degrees. And of course, the market will decide. And I think for the first time, we're being challenged because the reason of a university was a certification. Now, if certification is being challenged, you know, we will have to take this into account. And I would say this is education, but tomorrow it's research. If you look at it, crowdsourcing from the bioinformatics and so on, in astrophysics and so on, there are a lot of things that could be maybe done outside a university. And how we will, you know, how will this impact our institution is going to be very interesting. So the aspect being questioned, uh, uh, presently questioned are, I would say, the three things. The massive aspect, I've talked about it. We should really stop to report those numbers just of registration. It means very little, if nothing. We should keep them open, at least in Europe. This is a huge advantage that we have. We should now distinguish basic education versus continuous and professional education. I could foresee a monetization in the professional, but I still think that we should keep this European view that education is something that the state is behind, provides, and ensures. And I'm very much against any monetization of the basic education. The data privacy and ownership. And this is probably a post-NSA syndrome. But when you ask our students what are they the most concerned about is the data privacy. And I think that's where Europe needs to tackle with and the, and the platform owners. And I don't know if it is that some of this data have to be transported, be physically in Europe, but this is going to be a key issue. Now, will Europe develop its own platform or not? God knows. But I think this will have to be tackled. So what should we say, and that will be my last slide, about MOOCs? Is it a revolution or an evolution? I always believe that things are, being a biologist, a neurobiologist, is more towards an evolution. Now, we have to take something. You know, we've been there for 40 years with even more with online education. But I love this uh, quote from Rudy Dornbush from MIT at the Times that says, things take longer to happen than you think they will, and then they happen faster than you thought they could. And I think we're at this inflection point. Exactly how we will, you know, deploy, I have no idea. But as a president of a university, I cannot think that this will profoundly affect our mission and the way we work on those. So, and the second thing, I'm, even though despite the vote, which I'm ashamed of, of my country yesterday, I think there's, this is a unique opportunity 
for Europe to let its voice, the culture to be expressed. Maybe it's a little more difficult in science and technology, but even so, I think there is a way to look at problems. It's going to be even more so when you get in the humanities and the social sciences. So there is a need for Europe to produce material. The platform will be there. They'll develop. I think we have to help the EDX, the Coursera's, and the others to develop them. But I think the battle will be a battle of content. And we should have Europe, you know, become a player. I don't want that all the textbooks are written for, you know, from only one continent. I think it is extremely important to Europe. So yes, there are issues. Yes, there are problems. But fundamentally, I think this is, a re this is something that is happening that is too important to ignore. Thank you for your attention.